Hey guys. Hey Bo. Uh, hi Bo. Flippin' physics. Next we're gonna talk about circular motion. Now we can talk about circular motion where we have the angular velocity, which is omega is equal to the derivative of the angular position as a function of time. You could also have change in theta over change in time, which would be the average angular velocity as opposed to the derivative, which is of course the instantaneous angular velocity. And we have the angular acceleration, which is alpha or fishy thing, which is equal to the derivative of the angular velocity as a function of time, which would be the instantaneous uh, angular acceleration. We could also, if we're talking about circular motion, we could also talk about the centripetal acceleration, the acceleration that is responsible for the circular motion, the acceleration in the indirection because centripetal means center seeking. That's equal to the tangential velocity squared divided by the radius. It's also equal to the radius times the angular velocity squared. So we need to talk about tangential velocity. You'll notice I put tangential velocity equals the radius times the angular velocity in the middle. This is actually the equation on your equation sheet. You are not given either one of these two, but the reason I put these three up together is it turns out that if you take the integral of the tangential velocity times the radius is equal to the radius times the angular velocity with respect to time, you'll get the arc length, which is equal to the radius times the angular position. Just so you know, that's a lowercase cursive s, it stands for arc length. That's equal to the radius times the angular position. If you take the derivative of the tangential velocity equals equal to the radius times the angular velocity, you're going to get the tangential acceleration equals the radius times the fishy thing or the angular acceleration. So they only give you the one in the middle, but by giving you the tangential velocity equal to the radius times the angular velocity, you actually have all three. All you need to do is either take the integral to get the um, arc length or the derivative to get the tangential acceleration. And again, whenever you use these equations or centripetal acceleration, you need to make sure that you use radians because radians are dimensionless. Torque, or lowercase tau, is equal to R cross F, the lever arm cross product with the force. Please remember with the cross product, it is a vector and the order does matter. So it is R cross F. You need to remember how to use the unit vectors for it using the matrices to go through and solve that. Or if you're not gonna use unit vectors, it's just R F sine theta. We also have a couple of equations for torque, the net torque. One of the equations for net torque is it's equal to the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. We haven't yet defined the moment of inertia, it will in just a moment. The net torque, whenever you sum the torques, just like when you sum the forces, there are things that you need to identify. When you sum the torques, there are also things you need to identify. You need to define the axis of rotation, where are you summing the torques around, what point. You need to identify the object or objects you're summing the torques on. You need to identify the direction that you're actually summing the torques in, and you need to identify what the positive direction for torque is. Moment of inertia, always called ro hello. Moment of inertia, also called rotational mass. Again, just like the center of mass, we have two different equations for moment of inertia or rotational mass. One equation is for a rigid object with shape, and just like for center of mass, it is one that involves the integral. And be careful, a lot of times people confuse these two. So your tip for this, the rigid object with shape is one over the total mass equal to the, the integral of the position with respect to mass. For the moment of inertia, there is no one over the mass, and it's just the integral of r squared dm. And this is the distance from the axis of rotation squared, and you're integrating with respect to mass. When you do that, generally you need to deal with one of your various um, densities. Volumetric mass density, surface mass density, and linear mass density. Rho, sigma, lambda. Um, we don't really work with sigma, the surface mass density, much in mechanics. I include that because you do end up working with surface charge density and electricity and magnetism quite often, so just for completeness sake. But you end up working with the um, volumetric mass density or the linear mass density often with the moment of inertia. For a system of particles, the moment of inertia or rotational mass is equal to the sigma, the sum of the mr squared. So you just have a system of particles and it's gonna be the mass of each particle times r, the distance from the axis of rotation quantity squared. You also need to remember the parallel axis theorem. It'll come in handy sometimes. 
the parallel axis theorem, what you're doing is you're taking the moment of inertia about the center of mass and figuring out the moment of inertia of that rigid object with shape about some other point. And that it's going to be equal to the moment of inertia of the center of mass plus the mass of the whole thing times d squared, where d is the distance from the center of mass to the new axis of rotation. One common mistake with this is remember that you can only use this when you have a constant um, density of the object. Only works, the parallel axis theorem only works with a constant density. Two types of equilibrium. We have rotational and translational equilibrium. Translational equilibrium means that the net force is equal to zero, which means the acceleration of the object was, is equal to zero, which means the object is either, either moving at a constant velocity or at rest. A lot of times people think that this object in translational equilibrium has to be at rest. That is not correct. It has to not be accelerating, which means it's either at rest or moving at a constant velocity. Rotational equilibrium, the net torque is equal to zero, which means the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration is equal to zero, which means that the angular acceleration is equal to zero. Again, it's either at rest or moving at a constant angular velocity. Please remember whenever you're dealing with translational equilibrium or rotational equilibrium, you need to draw a free body diagram. Sum the forces, sum the torques, identify the objects, the direction, the axis of rotation, um, what, what the positive directions are. Please remember those basic concepts. Now that we have circular motion, we can talk about rotational kinetic energy. Whenever anything is rotating, it's going to have rotational kinetic energy, one half the moment of inertia times the angular velocity squared. Rolling without slipping simply means that it's rolling without slipping. It means it's rolling without slipping. To solve a problem that includes rolling without slipping, you need to use conservation of mechanical energy. Remember to identify your initial point, your final point, your zero line, and don't forget you have both rotational kinetic energy and translational kinetic energy and the velocity of the center of mass of the object equals the radius of the object times the angular velocity of the object. That's what's going to connect the rotational kinetic energy and the linear kinetic energy. Please. Angular momentum for a particle, R cross P. Again, the cross product, again, the order matters. If you're not dealing with unit vectors, you could just do R times momentum times the sine of theta, the angle between the position and the velocity. So R M V sine theta, where R is the distance from the axis of rotation to wherever the object is. Again, angular momentum, people often forget that angular momentum is about a specific point. You have to identify it. Something comes up on almost every AP test having to do with this. I'm gonna walk through it. It's a very basic concept right now. Let's say we have a piece of clay moving toward a circle, a cylinder of some sort that is rotating around a, its at center of mass here at point A. Now, this piece of clay has a moment of inertia as it's moving toward this cylinder, if you will, and we can figure out what it is. It's equal to r, the distance from the object to the axis of rotation, which is at point A, times the mass of the object, times the velocity of the object, times the sine of theta. Now, the issue here is that both r and theta are changing as a function of time, as a function of position. The way you deal with that is this. Sine of your angle theta is equal to opposite of our hypotenuse, where opposite that theta is d, and the hypotenuse is r. In other words, d is equal to r sine theta. Now, r may be changing as a function of position, theta may be changing as a function of position. However, d is constant. In other words, the angular momentum of the object as a function of time about point A is actually equal to d times the mass times the velocity comes up on just about every AP test at some point, probably on a multiple choice. That's angular momentum for particles. Now we need to talk about rigid objects with shape. Rigid objects with, with shape. The angular momentum is equal to the moment of inertia times the angular velocity. Ooh, I had something else. Oh, I just remembered. Um, so please, going back to rolling without slipping, this is the condition for rolling without slipping. People get really confused rolling with slipping. Well, when it's rolling with slipping, this is no longer true. So it asks sometimes, okay, when does it stop roll? When does it start rolling without slipping? So it'll, that's when this condition becomes true, when the, the velocity of the center of mass equals the radius of the object times the angular velocity. 
Coming back to rigid object with shape and the angular momentum is equal to the moment of inertia times the angular velocity. Again, the net torque, ro the rotational form of Newton's second law. It is equal to the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration is also equal to the net torque is equal to the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. It is also equal to the derivative of the angular momentum as a function of time. Just like the net force is equal to mass times acceleration, but more generally it is equal to the derivative of momentum as a function of time, the t net torque is equal to the derivative of the angular momentum as a function of time. Now, if all the torques are internal, and again, you have to identify your axis of rotation whenever you're summing the torques, that means if the net torque is equal to zero, in other words, there are, um, there, there are no external torques, this means that the momentum, angular momentum, is not changing. Therefore, the sum of the initial momentum equals the sum of the final momentum. Conservation of angular momentum. And again, you have to identify your axis of rotation. Please. Newton's universal law of gravitation. The, gra the force of gravity between any two objects is equal to negative big G mass 1 mass 2 divided by r squared times the unit vector r. Big G is a universal gravitational constant 6.67 times 10 to the uh, negative 11, what is it, Newtons times meter squared over kilogram squared. So the force of gravity, this is the force of gravity that exists between any two objects that are always being pulled toward one another whenever you have two objects. So one thing that people forget about this, this is the unit vector, so it just has to do with the direction, but the main thing people forget is that R is not the radius. R is defined as the distance between the center of masses of the two objects, and it's especially confusing because sometimes R actually does work out to be the radius. But by definition, it is not. It is the distance between the center of masses of the two objects. I want to talk about Kepler's third law. Please do not memorize Kepler's third law. Instead, remember how it's derived. In Kepler's third law, we start with the net force in the indirection, which is equal to the force of gravity, which is equal to mass times the centripetal acceleration, centripetal acceleration, because it's the acceleration in the indirection. The force of gravity is Newton's universal law of gravitation, because we're talking about two objects, you're usually talking about the thing that's in an orbit around the giant thing. We'll call the thing that's in orbit mass one. So we have big G, Newton's universal gravitational constant times mass one times mass two divided by r squared, where r is the distance between the center of masses of two objects. Now, on the other side, you have mass one, which is the satellite, times the centripetal acceleration. We can use the radius times the angular velocity squared. Now, notice in this particular case, even though the r is defined as the distance between the center of masses of the two objects, it is also the radius. In other words, these two r's are the same, and we can end up with big G times the mass of the planet is equal to the radius cubed times the angular velocity squared. This is, of course, the radius of the orbit of the object. Now, with Kepler's third law, we generally need to look at the angular velocity. Angular velocity is the change in angular position as over change in time. That would be the average angular velocity. If we're talking about one full revolution, the time would be the period. That's the definition of the period. And for a one full revolution, the change in theta would be 2 pi radians. In other words, the angular velocity is equal to 2 pi divided by the period. We can substitute that back into our equation. And this is Kepler's third law. If you rearrange it for the period squared, you'll get Kepler's third law. But that's the basic idea. The fact that you end up using this, and who knows exactly what they're going to ask you to solve for. Please do not memorize Kepler's third law. It's a bad idea. Please just remember how it is derived. Another basic thing that I want to make sure we get here is that frequency is equal to 1 over the period, which means that the angular velocity is equal to 2 pi times the frequency. When we get to simple harmonic motion, this is going to be called the angular frequency. And often people think that the angular frequency and the frequency are the same thing. Angular frequency and the frequency are clearly not the same thing. Universal gravitational potential energy. Negative big G m1, m2 over r. Notice the similarity between the two often confusing, uh, leaving or adding the square. So be careful of that. Universal gravitational potential energy, big G m1, m2 over r. Notice that the zero line is already preset for universal gravitational potential energy. The, r, the zero line is at r is equal to infinity. One over infinity is zero. Therefore, the zero line is infinitely far away. Therefore, notice the gravitational potential energy is, universal gravitational potential energy is always negative. And you have to have two objects. You cannot have gravitational potential energy, universal gravitational potential energy, without two objects. Please.
Simple Harmonic Motion, SHM. The condition that must be met in order to have simple harmonic motion is that the second derivative of a position as a function of time is equal to negative omega squared times the position where omega is the angular frequency. That is, if you could show that the motion of an object follows that pattern, whatever you have for angular frequency, you could figure out the period. We'll go through that in just a moment. And one equation that fits for that is that the position as a function of time is equal to the amplitude times the cosine of the angular frequency times time plus the phase constant, the phase shift. That's all it is. It's just how much you're shifting from cosine or sine or whichever one you want to have. And you could take the derivative of this to get the velocity. You can take the second derivative of it to get the acceleration, so on and so forth. Let's go through a specific example. We're just going to talk about a mass spring system. Let's talk about a mass spring system. In a mass spring system, the net force in the x direction is going to be equal to the negative of the force of the spring, assuming the force of the spring is going to be to the left. The force of the spring is, is k, the spring constant times the position, so we have negative kx equals mass times the acceleration in the x direction. In other words, the acceleration with respect to x is equal to negative k over m times x, or acceleration, which is the second derivative of position as a function of time in the x direction, is going to be equal to the negative the k, the spring constant, divided by mass times the position. In other words, omega, the angular frequency for a mass spring system, is equal to the square root of the spring constant divided by the mass. And the angular frequency then is equal to 2 pi divided by the period. We already figured that out before. Which means that the period of a mass spring system is equal to 2 pi times the square root of mass times the spring, or <laughs> the square root of mass divided by the spring constant. Just deriving the, the period for a mass spring system. And anything that's in simple harmonic motion, you can figure out the period for using that basic concept. We also have the period for a pendulum. For a pendulum, the period is going to be equal to 2 pi times the square root of the length of the pendulum, the distance from the center of suspension to the center of mass of the object, or the pendulum bob, divided by the acceleration due to gravity on whatever planet you're talking about. In simple harmonic motion, generally we deal with non-damped simple harmonic motion, which means energy is going to be conserved, which means that the total energy is going to be equal to, if you're talking about um, all the way at the amplitude, the total energy would be 1 half k times the amplitude squared, which would equal to, if we're talking about the total energy, we could be talking about the equilibrium position. This would be the point at which it has the maximum acceleration, it has zero elastic potential energy, therefore the energy would be entirely kinetic energy, one half mass times velocity, and maximum squared. That is my review of the entire mechanics AP Physics C curriculum. A brief one at that, but I hope you enjoyed learning with me today. I enjoyed learning with you. Lecture notes are available at flippingphysics.com. Please enjoy lecture notes responsibly. <laughs> Uh, 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 uh.